Zach Purton, welcome to the Wolf Den. Thank you. How are you, mate? I'm good. Good to be back home? It has been. It's been really good. Um, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time in Australia um, the last five or six years. Mm. Obviously, because of COVID, that p- played some part. And But uh, normally I don't come back here in the off-season. Yeah. I normally yeah. go to Europe or America or, or somewhere else, but um, the house was being renovated and we wanted to come back and see how that was coming yeah. along. And yeah. it just worked in well. We went to Hawaii first. Unreal. So we got a little bit of sun there and then come back here. Might be regretting that decision when I get on the scales. <laughs> yeah, so – and you, you let yourself go a bit, do you? You, you put on some weight? I have, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been really good, you know, for a long period of time. I reckon it's probably been 10 years since I let myself get to this stage. And I don't feel like I've been eating too much. Yeah. Of course, we've been going out every night for dinner and catching mm. up with friends, and which has been really good. Uh, but I just think because I'm in the cold, my body's just hanging on to it and – yeah, I feel I feel pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, and um, so how much like what kind of weight would you have to lose when you're heading back to Hong Kong? I reckon, by the feel of me, I think I'm probably about 63, 64 kilos. Oh wow! Yeah. But I haven't weighed myself, so yeah. you know I ride at fifty four and a half. So <laughs> I've got a fair bit of work to do. And will you just forget about it until you get on the plane to go back to Hong Kong, or are you going to start working on it while you're here? I go back tonight, so wow. Yeah, it's too too late okay. to forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> And uh, did you watch the races yesterday? No, I, I seen the snippet of um, your old mate. winning. What about your old mate, Mr. Brightside? Mr. Brightside, yeah. Yeah. Any chance of you being able to get back on him or was Willow? Uh, you never know, yeah. but uh, it was Willow's horse to start with. I only got on the ride because he had the fall with Grammy yeah. Car and broke his collarbone. So I just filled in yeah. Um, yeah, for the seemed, time being. But I was listening to his post-race interview and he was very confident about him and Mr. Brightside were going all the way through the spring and they were going to dominate and this and that, which, of course, you'd expect him to be. But He just keeps getting better, doesn't he, that yeah. horse? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it was a win of a weight for age superstar yesterday, wasn't it? Really, and really The time impressive. was there as well. Yeah. Mm, that's yeah. what that, yes. that was Did he break part. a track record? I think he was 0.5 of a second outside it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, to get things going, I want, to, I want to talk to you about your competitive nature. It's well documented. You're very proud of it. And to get us in the mood, I want to play this clip, which you might have seen because you're wearing a Bengals hat, uh, sorry, a Browns hat. <laughs> And you probably like Tom Brady, but let's listen to what Tom says. This is one of his documentaries. Baby. Baby. What? I'm going to watch. Huh? Good evening. What are you willing to do and what are you willing to give up to be the best you can be? You only have so much energy, and the clock's ticking on all of us. And when you say yes to something, it means you got to say no to something else. In the end, my life's focused around football. It always has been and always will be, as long as I'm playing. What's up? Good. So professional. What's up? I've given my body, my everything, every bit of energy for 18 years to it. Good to see you. How are you feeling? I am doing OK. So if you're going to compete against me, you better be willing to give up your life. Well, day's good. Because I'm giving up mine. Um, so there is the goat. So does that resonate with you? Do you feel that you've given up your life basically over the last 20 years to get to where you're at? And Yeah, I've made a lot of sacrifices as, as a lot of other jockeys uh, would have as well. But, you know, we can't go out and party on a Friday night or a Saturday night and um, my wife is, is great. She understands that. Mm. Uh, everything I do every day, uh, I put my career first. So I miss out on some of the sporting events that the kids go to, mm-hmm. some of the uh, school fairs, things like that, uh, just to make sure that if I need to train or I need to wait, lose weight or I need to do form and mm. I need to prepare myself to be um, at my best on, on race day, then everything else gets sacrificed and you know, it's just the mentality that you need to have. Mm. And so in this sort of – in the last decade, sports become such a huge part of, of world business and, and whatnot and the hyper-professionalism of it. And there's also people like Tom Brady have come along and basically said, look, I'm a born winner. I, I have to win and I'm proud to admit that. Mm. And a lot of other people have come along and emulated that as well. And are you like that as well? Like are you – you know, put your hand up and said you're a born winner and, and it's all about competition. And when you're on the sporting field, you have to be the best. And if you're not, you're disappointed with yourself. So Tom Brady's an interesting one because he uh, he wasn't picked that highly mm. um, in the draft. So, so he, he obviously wasn't identified to have the, the talent that uh, he ended up having and he had, mm. to, he had to work at it and he mm. just dedicated everything to it. And I've read uh, his books on his diet and 
and what he does outside of uh, his training as well. And he was just totally committed to everything he did. But um, as I've gone through my career, I've had to change the way I train, change the way I eat. Um, we have a lot more information available to mm. us these days, uh, nutrition-wise. So I went to a plant-based diet uh, about six or seven years ago. So and does I was, that mean you're vegan? I was vegan. I was purely vegan for three years. Yes. Um, and I felt amazing. My body was great. I had a lot of energy. Um, I could, uh, instead of my weight ballooning up and down and up and down and it being as hard as it was, it was more even. Yeah. Uh, and then I, you know, it gave me a, a bit more freedom to, to do a few other things. Um, but after three years, I was, I, I went away on holidays in the off season and the people we were with, they were sort of eating, you know, steaks and whatever else. And I sort of just grabbed a little bit here and grabbed a little bit there. And, and then, um, I would say I'm probably about 85% vegan now and it's okay. when I go out for dinner yes. um, with owners. Uh, I, I'm not picky with what I yes. eat. I just, whatever they have that is available, I'll just yeah. eat the portion size that I am comfortable with. Yeah. Um, so at home, I'd be plant-based vegan. When I go out, I'd deviate a little bit. And I think that's probably the best thing for my body uh, as well. I think we do need to have a balanced diet. Yeah. So you have that, we had the, the nutritional side of it, um, you know, you have the mental side of it. Mm. Um, you got your personal training. I do yoga and Pilates. Is that uh, it for training? Just yoga and Pilates? Nothing else? No, like strength and conditioning as well. I don't do weights. Yeah, uh, I do body weight stuff. So with yes. the personal trainer, we, we just tailor the exercises. Because um, Tom Brady do, only does sort of body weight stuff. Really, he does a bit of resistance mm. band, and he, he stays away from the heavy heavy weights. Well, for us, weight is the most important thing. And yes. if I'm doing weights and bulking up, yeah. I can't ride the weight that I need to ride. So I need to be lean fit flexible um just a, a, a you know a more refined athlete yeah um but I, I don't have a regular personal training schedule i chop and change and mix it to what um i feel i need at the time say if i'm preparing for a melbourne cup i might do more cardio i might do more time on the bike i might do more running more hiking more swimming yeah um and then you have different times of the season. Like for us, December in the international is very important. Mm -hmm. Derby day is very important. Champions day is very important. So leading up to those events, I, I train a little bit harder. I do a little bit more. Just is that to just get you that extra 1% that you need because all the best horses and all the best jockeys are in for those? Exactly. I'm, I'm in a fortunate position where um, I'm given a lot of opportunity and, you know, there's a lot at stake for the, the owners, not just prize money, but, you know, the punters that follow these horses yeah. for myself, for my legacy. I want to win these races. Yeah. Um, so I need to make sure that I'm, I'm preparing well and giving it everything, but you can't stay at that level for 10 months of the season. You cook yourself. So right. I, I ebb, ebb and flow a little bit. Um, when you say you cook yourself, what, the training is just too strenuous or? Yeah, it's just, if, if you're so focused on that and you're putting everything into that all the time in the environment that we're in Hong Kong, Hong Kong, it's a pressure cooker environment. You need to have a, a bit of a release. You have to have. You're, a, also, you're also moving into the mental state as well. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I am. So yeah. it's about um, giving it giving it everything at the right times, mm. but then rewarding yourself for, for that effort as well. Mm. Um, and I've just found that I've, I'm a, quite a social person. So if I'm purely focused on training and not giving a so, my social life any look in, then I end up cooking myself. And, and everyone in Hong Kong says the same thing. Mm. Um, the new trainer in Hong Kong, Jamie Richards, when he come, um, he, he said, he, he was just lived and breathed racing. It was just every morning at stables, he had his head in the stud books. He had his head, he was at the farms. He was just completely focused on racing. And he's realized in Hong Kong that you need to have other outlets. So he's taken up golf, he likes to go hiking, bike, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's the environment we're in. Mm. You've got a so for these um, NFL players, their shit season's actually yeah. quite short, right? Mm. Um, and they have rest days off in between game day and training day and things like that. So they've found the right balance um, as the NRL players, mm. AFL players do here. Mm. Um, it's I think balance is the is the the, the right word to be using for it. You got to find the balance. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to do bit later in the interview was ask you what a week looks for you looks like for you but yeah. we might bring that forward and talk about it now so for the for the, the sake of the show could we look like do you think you might be coming back for the Everest or something like that is there a, is there a chance you'd be back for that yeah it's a possibility um I, I've been sounded out for a ride already mm -hmm. um but uh, I haven't locked anything in mm -hmm. um I, I would like to focus on Melbourne 
a little bit more for mm-hmm. I can. The Melbourne Cup's a race that yeah. I so you're really you're like all in on the Melbourne Cup this year, yeah. I haven't got a ride yet. Yeah, so but I'm you would like to find a ride. Yeah, yeah. So would you if you're Obviously, Melbourne Cup's on a Tuesday. Will you be in Hong Kong the week before riding and everything as normal? Yeah, so as um, it has been in previous seasons, uh, this season's going to look a little bit different. But as it's been in previous seasons, I would have ridden in Hong Kong on the Sunday, got yeah. the midnight flight, got into Melbourne lunchtime on the Monday, mm-hmm. rode on the Tuesday and then got the overnight flight back to ride in Hong Kong on the Wednesday. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. It's the same when I, I come to ride here in Australia. I generally get in on the Friday, ride and fly back the Saturday night to ride there Sunday. Um, but the jockey club's going to be a little bit more flexible going forward. Uh, they've realised... On all jockeys or just... On, well, on all jockeys. Because there's a lot of people going back and forth. And a lot of Aussies over there at the moment, isn't there? There are, but the jockey club has found it, and COVID played a part, and the political um, unrest that we had in Hong Kong has played a part as well. But also the dominance of um, Douglas White, Marrera and myself... A lot of jockeys don't really want to come to Hong Kong at the moment. Mm-hmm. They, or the ones that have been, haven't done that well, and it's mm. it's sort of put a lot of people off. Mm. And then, um, so there's just that little bit of a knock, and they realise that they need to be a little bit more flexible. So mm-hmm. if they want to attract the best jockeys to come there, they're going to allow us to travel more freely. Um, so previously, if there was a race meeting on in Hong Kong, we couldn't miss that race meeting. We had to be there. We're contracted to ride right. to them, um, and. They didn't really like us missing the barrier trials yeah. either. They wanted us there. The owners are paying the bill and, and yeah. they feel like we should be available f- for them, which is fine. But going forward, they're going to allow us, say, I might come down here and stay for the whole spring carnival, um, the whole week of the of the spring carnival at Flemington. Um, they've said if I want to go to Japan for two months, I can go there for two months and then come wow. back. Yeah. So they're being more flexible to try and encourage uh, more jockeys to come. And is that maybe why Huey's over there now? Because he, he, can, cause he was riding yesterday. Yeah, well, I said to him, you know, it's the off-season, mate. You should be having a bit of a break. Yeah. He rode in Singapore, he's ridden here. He, yeah. he hasn't given his body a break. And I think as he gets into the season coming up, he'll get three, four months in and he'll start to feel a bit tired Yeah, because he hasn't given his mind and body the break that he probably should have given it. He just loves it that much, does he? He just loves being on the good horses. And there, there, There's a part of that. Um, but we're, we're in slightly different positions. I've been in Hong Kong for such a long period of time now yeah. that I – think I have a better understanding of what is needed and what, what might works at the moment uh, might work at the moment but also I think he was down here to test a couple of horses for to, that are going to go deeper in, into the carnival and, and that's fine mm. if that's what he wants to do but I just think um, if you don't have that break with the environment yeah. that we're in he'll get to a point where he's feeling a bit flat yeah yeah um, so why don't we move back to just a week in, the, in your life in Hong Kong so let's start on a Monday so what happens on a Monday with Zach? Um, so, assuming you just rode on the Sunday, had yeah. a good had a good meeting on the Sunday. Let's say you rode four or five winners, and then Monday comes along. What happens? Straight back to the track. Yeah. I don't, don't have a day off. So, uh, for the people that don't know, we live on the race course right. uh, at Sha Tin. We're all yeah. in the same building. Oh, there's there's two buildings there: the trainers, jockeys, uh, some of the the vets, mm-hmm. some of the um, executives live in live in these buildings. So, uh, and and. Where the winning post is at Sha Tin, mm-hmm. just past that on the left-hand side is a grey building, which is the clubhouse, mm-hmm. and beside that is is where we live. So if I have to gallop a horse at 5 o'clock, I can wake up at 5.45, uh, 4.45, yeah. roll out of bed, brush my teeth, get dressed, go right to the yeah. track. So I'm at the track within 15 minutes on a horse. Yeah. Uh, I ride track work six days a week. Some jockeys ride seven days a week, but I, I like to have Sunday morning off because <laughs> uh, we race on a Sunday as well. So I'm on a horse every single day. Yeah. So and it's always early morning track work in Hong Kong? Yeah, so the track opens at 4.45 and closes at uh, 8.45. Right. And there's a small little harrow break for 20 minutes in between that um, just to, you know, even the track back up because we have a lot of horses working and, you know, you, you want to make sure they've got a good surface yeah. to work on so that they'll harrow the track and, and then we start again. So, yeah, uh, track work Monday to Saturday. Yep. So and, every morning, yep, okay. Uh, and... Uh, we have barrier trials twice a week, mm-hmm. so every Tuesday and Friday. Um, we some we have once a month we'll have barrier trials at Happy Valley on a Saturday, mm-hmm. and then we race on Wednesday night and yeah. Sunday afternoon. Yes. So in Hong Kong, when when we're racing on a Sunday, we we don't get a day off. I'm working every single day. Yeah. And that's what it's like basically for ten months of the season. 
we have one week off over Royal Ascot where there's yeah. no Wednesday meeting. Yeah. But that's within 10 days of the end of the season. Yes. The only time I get a morning off is if we race on a Saturday. Yes, which happens and about once a month, doesn't it? They, they were trying to get it to once a month, but looking at the program for the season coming up, I think there are only five mm. Saturday meetings. Mm. So it's going to be a pretty hectic yeah. year. Yeah. And, and that's where I'm saying you're sort of better off having a break now because it's going to be pretty full on when we go back. But outside of that, you know, on, on a Monday, uh, Thursday, I'll do the personal training. Um, depending on what weight I have to ride, uh, I try and slip either a hike or a run in. Um, I'll get on the bike. Um, I try and swim a little bit. I don't swim as much as I should. I just don't like the swimming pool at the clubhouse in uh -huh. Chartin. It's indoors and I just feel – it just feels dirty to me. I just don't like getting in there. So yeah. it's only when we go out to Bees River, which is basically like a country club. Um, the jockey club owner run that as well. So the retired race horses go out there and they get – um, farmed out to people that want to take them as dressage horses and things like that, which is really good. So yeah. they can have a life after racing. But out there, they've got a beautiful swimming pool um, outdoors. They've got a leisure pool as well. They've got uh, restaurants. They've got chalets to stay in. Um, so it's a good facility and, and I'll go out there and swim. But uh, um, outside of that, I try and play as much golf as I can yeah, as well. A uh -huh. little bit of tennis. Um, and then obviously the yoga, the Pilates. Yeah. Uh, so I think once I, you package all of that up, yeah. it's quite a lot of exercise to be doing every week. And then once again, you've got to find the balance that you don't want to tip yourself over, make yourself tired, yeah. train too much. So I like to keep myself slightly on the fresh side. Yeah. Um, and are you tired after a 10 race, 10 or 11 race meeting at Chartin on a Sunday? Are you really tired? I'm, I'm not, no. I, I think we're used to it. Like yeah. being on a horse every day, um, and having ridden for as long as I have and, you know, I generally have 10 rides on a Sunday. I don't like to have 10. I'd prefer to have seven or eight because I like to have a little bit of a break in between. But just with the position I'm in, yeah. I, you know, it's very hard to say no yeah. if the trainer's known as a supporting me and they've asked me to ride a horse and I'm sitting in the jockey's room with no ride. It's yeah. not a good look. So yeah. uh, I have to spin some horses around I don't want to be on. Yeah. But uh, it's the nature of the beast. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a long day. Our first race is at one o'clock and we don't finish until 5.50. And you know, that with half an hour between races, they're asking us to go down to the parade ring about 14, 15 minutes before the start of every race. So by the time you get on your horse, you go to the gates, you walk around, you run the race, you pull up, you come back in, you speak to the trainer. The owners don't come down to see the horses in Hong Kong. It's only the trainers. Right. So you, you give them the feedback or the assistant trainer. You weigh back in. Then you've got to weigh back out, get your saddle ready, weigh back out for the next yeah. race. We have about one or two minutes. Really? You don't even get like five minutes to just... To sit down and we're getting called back out for the next race. Right. Yeah. And if you've got to go into the steward's room, it yeah. you know adds yeah. a bit more pressure and you're sort of rushing around a little yeah. bit. So for those six hours on a Sunday afternoon, we don't stop. It's just bang, 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 bang. So there's a lot going on, but um, I don't get home and feel like I'm exhausted or gassed or anything like that. You know, I've got to go yeah. home and do my homework, so. Yeah, let's uh, talk about that, doing the form. Must be, a, is it a huge part of your success? I, I believe it is, and, and I believe in anything in life, if you do your homework, um, you know, you're gonna be better placed and more mm. comfortable, right? So. I need to uh, – we're lucky in Hong Kong that we only have 1,200 horses. Mm. So you can become quite familiar with them quite quickly. And the more horses I ride, the more familiar I, I get with them because then you understand what their tendencies are and things like that. And then further down the line, if you're up against them, mm. you know what they're going to do. But, um, you know, I need to watch the track work of my horse. I need to watch the barrier trials of my horse. I need to watch the races of my horse. I need to – understand what makes that horse work right so as you would understand some horses like to show speed some like to be ridden quiet some like to come on the outside some are good mm. to, to come between runners some have got a short sprint some can sustain a long sprint some hang in some hang out and you're in a you unique know. position because a lot of punters evaluate all the stuff that you're talking about yeah there's nothing they can do about it but you can actually do something about it you can know those idiosyncrasies that the horses have and 
and use that to a winning advantage. Well, I've got to formulate a plan, right? So yeah. I, I might have drawn barrier 12, it shuts in over 1,200, and my horse likes to race on pace, but there are six other horses inside me that like to race in the same position I'm in. So I've got to work out, you know, am I going to try and get in front of a couple of them or am I getting behind them or do I take the chance that a gap might open up? Um, but then, you know, you've got to take into account the rail position, the track bias on the day, the weather and conditions, um, you know, how the race, the, the track has been playing in the previous races, obviously mm -hmm. the track bias. You've got to take into account the jockeys that are riding the horses because mm -hmm. jockeys have um, certain things that they repeat. Yes. And once you get to understand what they might do in those situations, you can predict what they're going to do. Mm. So I need to understand exactly what my horse is capable of, but then I've got to do the form on the other 13 horses in the race as well. Mm. And I need to create that speed map where I believe I know where they're all going to position themselves in the race. And then from that, you know, the gates open and things go wrong. Mm. A horse might stand there and miss the start. A horse might knuckle on jumping. All of a sudden there's a little bit more speed that comes out of the race. Or then you might be in a race where it looks like there's no speed and five connections have said, oh, there's no speed, let's go forward today. And all of a sudden, mm. you know, the speed's there. So you've got to be prepared um, for the unexpected. And you, just, you basically, you've got to ride on feel. You've got to have a plan, but you've got to be able to react to what's happening at the same time as well. So there are a lot of things that go into it. And then things can happen during a race, like in Australia, Things don't happen as often in Hong Kong. They seem to jump out, get their spot, sit there, wait till the 400 metre mark and then they all breeze home. Mm. In Hong Kong, you've got jockeys taken off, you've got things happening, you know, the tempo of the race is changing. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it just doesn't stop. Mm. And our races are run at quite a fast speed. Mm. Every jockey that comes to Hong Kong says to me they're really surprised at how quick the races are run and mm. they're really surprised at how quick everyone is to get a position. Mm, it's tight. Happy Valley's tight, isn't it? It's like very you fly tight. around that turn and yeah. they all fan out. And well, that's the other thing at the Valley, right? Like it's a 275 metre running. You think it's only a short straight. You don't have much time to make up any ground. So a lot of jockeys will get out and get going early when a lot of the time it's the best track in the world just to sit and wait for the run. Yes. Then when they present, you've got plenty of horse to yeah. be able to, to press the button. Press the button. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's just about understanding how the track's playing, how the race is going to be run and your horse. And you know, at the end of the day, we, I get it wrong more than I get it right. Mm. Like I, I won 25% of the races last season. It's a, it's a high stat, high number. Mm. I still got beaten 75% yeah, of them. A so, of, a lot of beats. And yeah. um, do you get help with doing the form? Like do you have a, a, a form analyst to help you with all this kind of stuff? I, I do it all myself. Wow. I, I want to live and die by my own sword. How I many hours a week are you spending doing it, you reckon? It, de it depends um, on the type of horse I'm riding. If I'm riding a lot of horses that, for that meeting that might race on pace, I probably don't have to do as much form because, you know, all you're doing is getting out the gates, you get in your position. I don't have to worry too much about what's happening behind me. But mm -hmm. if you're on horses that settle back in the field, you've got to do a little bit more form. If I'm on horses I'm not familiar with, I've got to, got to do a little bit more form. I, I would say, um, you know, on, on average... Two and a half hours, maybe three for, for every meeting, Yeah, which is, which is not a huge amount. But when you've got the limited number of horses we've got, you get to see a lot of them yeah, quite regularly. Yeah, you've got a lot of yeah. um, me memory of them all. Yeah. Because that's what a lot of it, you look at the NFL and all the quarterbacks are sitting there watching film all day, aren't they? They are. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure most elite yeah. sports people spend a lot of time watching film. Exactly. You've you got to understand the player you're coming up against because, like I said, like, a lot of players have a tendency to do a similar thing. So if you, if you can read what they're going to do before they do it, it's the same with yeah. jockeys in a race. I, that some of them have got a tendency to, to go one way or go the other way or make an early move or wait longer. I'll get stuck behind some jockeys and I'm just like, oh, my God, like this jockey's always waiting too long. Yeah, He never gets here in time. He doesn't put his horse into the race early enough, mm -hmm. blah, blah, and I'm stuck behind him. Mm. So what hope have I got? Yeah. And I'm thinking I've got to try and get out from behind this guy as quick yeah. as I can. Yeah. Let's do the, a quick form on a race at the Cox Plate, Romantic Warrior. What are you thinking? Yeah, so I, this, this is a, a tricky one because um, I think he's going to be suited by Happy Valley, mm -hmm. uh, by Mooney Valley. Yeah. He's got gate speed. He can put himself in the right position. He can box seat. Um, he's got a, a good little turn of foot. But I think his record is a bit better than 
what his ability is. Mm -hmm. He won the derby uh, by beating California Spangle, who can't run 2,000. Mm -hmm. And he's known for giving races away. You mm -hmm. breathe down his neck, he gives up. Uh, COVID was on, so they were, we had no international horses. So he then won the QE2. Um, and then he got beat. Uh, by Golden 60 in the Gold Cup. Mm. Golden 60 is not really a 2,000 metre horse, but he was able to beat him. Mm. Sure, he was impressive in December. Yes. But the Japanese horses didn't turn up that day. Mm -hmm. they, all, they were all cooked from the previous run in Japan. And the previous Gold Cup that he, he raced in, the, the, the most recent one, when Golden 60 beat him, there was a length and a half between some pretty average horses in Hong Kong. Yes they shouldn't be able to get as close to him as what they got to him. And then he, he won the QE2, but I think they were they were like two seconds or something outside of standard. Like they mm. absolutely walked in that race. And he was in a position where he just controlled the race, sprinted home. Yeah, he put a gap on him, looked good. But if that was a genuinely run race, I believe he would have been beaten mm. on that race. So I, I think his form reads better mm -hmm. than what his ability is. And I'll be interested to see how he measures up. Yeah, Danny, he's, I, he's, I think for me, there's a bit of a warning Morning, Bell. Will you be riding him? McDonald's going to ride him. He's locked in, isn't yeah. he? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but you would like to ride the Cox Plate? Sure. Yeah, yeah. if I can get a ride. Yeah, yeah. unreal, unreal. Um, interesting. Okay, so I wanted to talk a bit about some of your sort your biggest battles um, over the years. And the, the first one is if we go way back. I heard when you first arrived in Hong Kong, you basically wanted to go home. You, you didn't, it just didn't work out. But then I believe you, you know, people close to you said stick at it and, and you ended up becoming very, very successful, but what what was the path that you took to get that success and to improve? So when I arrived in Hong Kong, um, the jockeys roster was full of the who's who of the jockeys from around the world. Mm. We had Douglas White, Brett Preble, Olivia Deleuze, Gerard Mosse, Eric Saint-Martin, Felix Kutzi, Anthony Delpesh, Danny Nicolick, Shane Dye, wow. Glenn Boss arrived at the same time as me, as did Kevin Shea, and because EI hit in Australia, Darren Beeman come about two or three weeks after me. Yeah. So you get all those jockeys that are well established, they know who they are, especially the ones that were in Hong Kong, they'd been there for 10 or so years, and they had the connections with the owners and the trainers. They'd been successful for them, they'd won for them. So why are they going to put a young kid on that they don't know, that mm. they haven't heard of, over all these jockeys that they have a relationship with? It was just really hard to get an opportunity. Mm. Um, but what happened was, I, I remember it clearly, in, in eight meetings time, so in one month time, I knew I had this horse I thought could win and I got there and it won. Mm. And then I knew in another eight meetings time, another month, I had a horse I thought could win and then I won on it. I thought, okay, when I am getting on the horses, I'm getting the job done and delivering, I've just got to get more opportunities. Mm. And... In Australia, you have a manager who chases your rides, liaises with the trainers and the owners, books all your barrier trials, your race rides. As a jockey in Australia, you basically just turn up race day. Mm. In Hong Kong, you're not allowed to have a manager. Really? You've got to do all that yourself. Uh, mm. So I used to just sit there and wait for my phone to ring. My phone never rung. Does it ring now? It rings now. <laughs> but the trainers were telling me, we want to see that you're keen. You've got to be proactive. We need to, to see that you're asking for these horses because, look, at all these other jockeys that are asking to ride the horse. So we're going to put them on because they're showing interest. Mm. We're not hearing from you, so mm. we're not even thinking of you. You didn't know how to play the game. I didn't know how to play the game. And then, like I said, the social side of Hong Kong is, is really important. So the more I started to get out and meet owners and build a relationship, blah, 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 then they were more willing to give me opportunities and support and then things just slowly started to pick up. And at the end of my first season, uh, Glenn Boss had a fight with Ricky Yu mm -hmm. and told him to go shove it. So Ricky come to me and he said, uh, would you like to ride for me? I don't have a jockey at the moment. I said, well, I'm not riding for anyone else. So no problem. And I rode 10 winners in the last month. Yes. You ride 10 winners in a month in Hong Kong, you're absolutely flying. Yeah. We, have, we race for 10 months of the season. If you do that every month, that's 100 winners for the season. There's only been three jockeys in Hong Kong racing history, Douglas White, Moreira and myself, to ride 100 or more winners in a season. So I finished that season really well and that gave me the confidence to come back the next season 
and think, okay, things might end up okay. So my first 10 seasons there, I rode more winners the next season than I did the previous season. So yeah. I just continued to get better and better and better with the extra support I was getting. But it, it all just, it was about getting off opportunity. It was about chasing rides. It was about getting out there and meeting people. Um, and then of course, you know, understanding Hong Kong racing better as well. Understanding the tracks and the bias and the horses and the tempo, and, you know, it, it all just started to come together. Mm. And I believe your wife, Nicole's been a, quite a big role in your professional career, is that right? She's yeah, she has. So in that first season, um, when I thought about coming back to Australia, uh, we were on holiday in uh, Phuket and I was just sitting there and I said, oh, I, don't, I just don't want to go back. I wow. said, I'm, I've just had enough. And she's like, no, you know, you can do it. You'll be right, blah, blah, blah. She goes, I love Hong Kong. I don't want to go home. So I said, oh, okay, I'll stick it out a little bit longer. So if it wasn't for her, I probably would have come home. But yeah. she's, uh, she's my number one supporter, my yeah. biggest cheerleader. Uh, but she just gets it. Like, she's great with the, with the owners when we're at dinner. Yeah. Uh, she understands racing. In Hong Kong, the girls become really involved yes. in it. One, because they're mostly not working over there. Like, yes. I, don't, I don't really know any Western jockeys who has who has a wife that's working in Hong Kong yes so then um the, they live and breathe what we're doing so they might come to the barrier trials or you know track work sometimes they come to all the functions with uh, with us that the club puts on um the club might invite them to the race meetings so they get to hear and understand what's going on around the place um and then obviously they see us doing our form and whatever else whereas in australia they have their life, they go to work, yes. they do their thing, we go to the races, we come home, yes. they might not even know what's going on. Yes. Uh, so I think because she's got such a good understanding of what's going on, she knows what I need. Yeah. Uh, she knows when I need to be pacified. She yeah. knows when I need to be driven. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's good. So she she makes sure all the kids are looked after. And, How many and, kids and you got? I've got two. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she, she prioritises me and my career over everything else yeah. that goes on so but it's part so of the grander plan isn't it i'm sure there's a you guys are heading to where all the hard work from both of you guys leaves you guys with a, with a beautiful life i guess so yeah so fortunately for us um in uh hong kong uh you know with the prize money that's there it's it's, it's massive and mm. we have a low tax rate we don't have any expenses because we live on the course so we don't have to pay any rent or anything like that so it gives us a great opportunity to invest the money that we make. Uh, and then as you know, money makes money and yeah. things continue to get easier and better. Uh, so our plan obviously was to try and set ourselves up for the rest of our lives. And fortunately, uh, we're okay. We're not airborne. We're not, mm. we're not going as well as you're going, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to be able to keep putting food on the table for a little bit longer. Yeah. And what about the business of being Zach? What what happens when racing finishes? Do you, do you want to have a business career outside of racing or will you stay in racing? I don't think I'll stay in racing. Like I, I, I love the sport, um, but like what role can I play in racing? I don't want to be a trainer. I don't, my wife wants me to be a trainer. Yeah. She keeps telling the jockey club in Hong Kong I'm going to be a trainer. <laughs> Tells all the owners I'm going to be a trainer. She's a bit of a horsey girl. She likes being in the stables. Yeah. But I can't see myself being a trainer. Um, I don't want to be a steward. I don't want to be an official. I don't. The only thing I could do is offer my time to the apprentices and yeah, say like a couple Corey of words, does. but yeah. like Corey does, but yeah. I don't want that to be my job. Mm. Um, I I like property. I've got a really big interest in property. Yeah, fantastic. So I would like to get into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I just want to play more golf, travel yeah. the world. All, all these things that I haven't been able to do because I've been locked away in Hong Kong, like going to a Super Bowl, going to the Masters, going to a Champions League final, all those big sporting events I want to – go and, and uh, soak those atmos atmospheres up. Yeah. But that'll only last so long. Yes. Once you tick that off and you do that, yeah. what do you do next? Yeah. Um, but because I, I enjoy my golf, um, I can travel around with a few buddies that organise some golf tours and mm. I like travelling. But real, real estate is what I feel like I'm going to go into. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So let's go back to your sort of path in Hong Kong and your battles. So your first really big win, or I guess let's call it your Super Bowl, was when you – Pip Douglas White for the first time for that jockey's premiership. Um, that must have meant a lot. It did. I I nearly beat him the year before. Um, I got off to a good start. We were neck and neck all the way through the season. And with about three weeks to go in the season, maybe four, 
Um, I was two winners behind him and I got kidney stones. Mm -hmm. So I had to go into hospital for the operation, uh, which unfortunately didn't go well. I ended up getting gangrene and got really sick and had to go delirious and I was sort of vomiting and passing out and had to go back in um, to try and clear my kidneys up. Um, So I missed, I think it was four or five meetings or something. And then by the time I come back, he was like eight or nine winners in front of me, Mm. two meetings to go. It was just over. But he was really disrespectful. He said, I love a challenge, you know, a rise of the occasion, all this crap. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> you can't say you had a challenge when I'm sitting on the sideline. Yeah. I like, had a free down kick. On the ground, yeah. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to take this yeah. guy down. And I come back to Australia and I met with a guy that had worked with some Olympic athletes um, on the mental side of things. And, and I cut the, the, the article out of the paper. And I've still got it in my drawer in my office at home. And I used to read it and fire myself up every time I felt like I was starting to get comfortable. And I just lived and breathed it every day. I trained hard. I went to sleep thinking about it. I woke up thinking about it. I was just going to do everything I can. But as it turned out, uh, I I had at that time the fastest 50 in Hong Kong racing history. I Uh hit the ground running. Yeah. And Dougie was – he was gone. In the rear he, he was – and it was going to take a big effort for him to try and catch me. But Marrera come at the end of October. So we started racing the middle of September. Six weeks later, Marrera arrived. Is that the first time he's arrived – Magic Man's – first time he's arrived in Hong Kong? Yes, because yeah. John Size uh, had sacked Douglas White the previous season. And um, he needed a jockey and he felt like Marrera was – the jockey that he wanted to use. So he he come. And I've never seen anyone come to Hong Kong and get the support that he had. Wow. He could ride the minimum weight, so he could ride every horse. I could only ride 120, so there were basically 25% of horses in every race that I didn't have the option of riding. And every owner in Hong Kong was was just swept up in this Maria Romania. Mm. So much so that he would have five or six horses to choose from in every race. He'd wait for the entries to come out. We call them entries, nominations here. Mm. And he'd look at the field and then he'd pick the best one. On his own again, right? He, he's not allowed any help. He's not allowed any help, yeah. no. Um, so once you get to see a field, you know, it's, it's very easy to start to pick the right ones, right? Yeah. But the challenge in Hong Kong for m- myself and for the other jockeys um, is we're getting asked to ride horses three, four, sometimes five or six weeks out from a race. I don't know what it's going to come up against. So yeah. I've got to go, okay, do I think that horse can win? Do I think it's a good ride? Okay, yeah, I do think it's a good ride. And then as you get closer, you get offered a better ride. But yeah. you can't take that one because you've taken this one. Right, so you have to commit a long way out. You commit a long way out. Yeah. Some jockeys will get off that horse to ride that horse, but I don't feel that's the right thing to do. Sure. I'm sort of a man of my word, and mm-hmm. if I say I'm going to ride your horse, then I'll ride it, even if a better horse comes along. Because I always think on a race day as well, I can get a little bit more out of my horse than maybe someone else can. And the barriers are very important. Mm. I might jump off this horse to ride that horse. Mm. This one draws barrier one, I draw 14. Yeah. And it's a better ride now anyway. Yeah. So it, it's very hard. But he was basically able just to pick whatever he want, wanted. Yeah. And he, uh, the, the battle I had with him that season, you know, but fortunately for me, he kept getting suspended. Mm-hmm. So he'd sort of catch up, get suspended, I'd get away, catch up. And, and I ended up winning the championship that year and then, I think he won it the next three years. I just had to sit there and yeah. just watch him dominate. Um, but he must have made you lift, lift he your did, game, He right? did. I, I then had to start studying what he did. So yeah. when I first went to Hong Kong, Douglas was successful. Yeah. And I used to analyse the way he rode and what he did. So Dougie, he basically rode the percentages. He hated going to the fence. He always wanted to be one out, one back. He always – and he'd quite often come out early and make sure his horse had plenty of room. He just rode the percentages all the time. Whereas Marrera and myself, we don't. We back ourselves. So we ride for a lot of luck. We save ground. And that's why Douglas White, the most winners he ever rode in a season was 112. So with all the support he had, winning 13 championships, basically having the the run of the joint for as long as he did, to be fair, there were only 66 meetings in a season back then and we have 88 now. But by the time Joe and I get to 66 meetings in a season, we're well past yeah. 112. Yes. And obviously – You Joe, did 170 last year, didn't you? 179. Is that a record? 
that's a record. So, what, so what was it, 170? 179. Yeah. 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 So because we ride for a bit more luck, save a bit more ground, we're winning those extra races that he wouldn't be re- winning because he's, he's just riding the percentage, just covering too much ground, mm. you know, coming up short quite often, winning a lot of races, playing it safe. But you can't get to the numbers that we got to if you just play it that safe all the time. Mm. And what was the rivalry like between you and the Magic Man? Were you, are you guys mates? You chat a bit or you sort of keep to yourself? So we, we, were, we were cordial. Yeah. Um, we used to sit next to each other at Chartin on yeah. a Sunday. So every Sunday I was sitting there. And being the Aussie that I am, um, there was a bit of sort of banter there to start with. And um, I was sort of winding him up a little bit. But I soon worked out that that didn't work for him with him because he just started kicking my ass. Yeah. So I had to drop off doing that. <laughs> um, but we played football together a little bit. We went yeah. for lunch a few times. Um, yeah, we, we got along well. Um, and, and when he was back here in Sydney recently and I come back, we had a good chat in the, in the jockey's room. And um, I would say for the, the rivalry we had on the track, we was, you know, you couldn't have had a better friendship than what we did off it. Yeah, nice. um, We got along quite well. And what's his movements now? Is he completely finished with Hong Kong or? Uh, at the moment, yes. Uh, so he decided that he wanted to start because the jockey club was, had, you know, they had us locked down, right? And he felt like he was in a cage and he mm. needed to get out. Uh, Hong Kong mentally cooked him. He, he had to get out. So he went back to Brazil. Uh, he's basing himself in Brazil, but he's going to travel the world. So uh, I thought he was going to go to Royal Ascot. He didn't end up going there. Mm. Um, but he's going to go and do a couple months in Japan coming up. He's going to come back to Australia for the Spring Carnival. He'll still come to Hong Kong for some of the big races. Uh, I think he, he might try and ride in America as well. But he, he wants to travel around and experience what the rest of the world has to offer instead mm. of just being based yeah. in Hong Kong. Bit of a yeah. sabbatical, yeah. 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 And what about the, the, the rivalry with J-Mac? Is that created by the media and people like me or is it a genuine rivalry? <laughs> there's no rivalry there. Okay. You're just <laughs> We're in different countries. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, so there's what about that, that day when... Was it Doncaster when you wrote a few winners? Uh, and oh, he, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that, bit you know, everyone was talking about that, that sorted out who the best jockey in the world was. That it wasn't, you didn't feel anything. No, like that. no, no. We yeah. just get out there and do our yeah. job, right? Like, um, I was, when I, when I did read that in the paper, I'm thinking, well, this is unfair. Like, he's on six odds on chances today, and I've got four rides at 15 to 20 to one. Like, yeah. I'm going, I'm going to get smashed here. And as it turned out, he had an average day, and I got lucky. So, yeah. But, yeah, no, J-Mac and I get along well. Yeah. Uh, he's a good kid. He's a great rider. Actually, I, I love him as a jockey. I yes. think he's got really good hands, great balance, good seat, great style. Yeah. Uh, I tell all the young kids these days that they should be watching uh, J-Mac. And if I was to come back as a jockey now, I'd certainly be trying to model and style myself on him. Yeah, awesome. And you think he should go to Hong Kong? Not at the moment, not while I'm there. Yeah, well <laughs> said, well said. <laughs> no, awesome. he's... he's uh, if and when when he comes to Hong Kong, um, I know he wasn't that keen to come to Hong Kong, but I think he's starting to warm to that idea now. Um, you know, I might only have six, 12, 18 months left in me. Mm. So uh, can you get the all-time record? Is it eighteen hundred and thirteen winners Douglas White has? Yeah, so I've just gone past sixteen hundred. Okay, it's very much in. So time. if I can have another good season this season, ride to say ride one hundred and fifty winners, whatever. Um, it puts that within touching distance yes. the following season. But that, that I can't see myself going on too much longer after yeah. that, right? Like I, my so plan was to retire in December, it's just gone. Yeah, so it's one or two. Is, is it the 1,813 winners that's the carrot that you might – I mean, obviously you're going on this season. And it's then the only thing less left that I really don't have. Like he, he'll always have the 13 um, championships in a row. I, mm. I don't think anyone will ever do that again. Like that's – just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but the 1816 I can certainly get to. But there's not really anything else that I don't have. Like I have the most winners in a season, most prize money won in a season, most group ones won overall, most group ones won in a season, most listed uh, group races won. Um, I've won the most internationals, the only jockey to win them twice, the only jockey to win every group one race in Hong Kong. So there's really not much mm. else for me to do there. Um, except chase that all-time record. Mm. Um, but my, I'm going to go back at the start of this season and see how my body feels mm. physically, mentally, see where I'm at. If things are good, then, yeah, I'll, I'll kick on. I'll, I'll start to go after it. Keep, keep uh, if I don't feel so good, then Australia's not a bad place to come home to. Yeah. 
And to finish up, when you um, were struggling in Hong Kong, did you was it about survival or was it still about you thinking, I want to be the next Douglas White, I want to dominate Hong Kong, or was it just survival? And did you never imagine that you'd get to where you got to? I, n- I never in my life thought I'd have the career that I've had. Yeah. You know, it's been far better than yeah. what I, I could I ever dreamed it, it would be. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm, I feel very fortunate. Um, and I don't have to do anything now. Like my legacy is set. I'll be remembered for what I've done. Um, and people can think of what I've done however way they want. If they think that I've been a great jockey, that's fine. If they don't like me as a jockey, that's fine as well. That's, that's up to them. Mm. Uh, I don't do it to try and be a star or uh, for the accolades or for the limelight. I just do it because they're, they're things that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Like I'm competitive. I want to win these races. I want to be successful. I want to ride winners. But um, I don't do it for the accolades. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was there and things weren't good, it was survival. I was just trying to ride a winner. I was just looking for an opportunity. Mm. Um, and... Sometimes you have to be patient, wait for that opportunity and when it comes, you've got to make the most of it. And, and luckily for me, I was able to make the most of it and, you know, here we are. Mm. And when it's all said and done in, say, a couple of years' time and you're living in Sydney in your new house and what does the perfect day for Zach look like in Sydney? Ah, uh, a little bit of golf in the morning and late lunch in the afternoon. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I Any like particular restaurant? <laughs> I'll go to all of them. Don't Mimi, worry. Have you been to Mimi since uh, Mimi's down? Yeah, it goes good. It good. goes very good. Yeah. We went there the first night we were back yeah. here, and I've, I must admit, I've been really impressed and surprised with Sydney since pumping I've been back here this really time. Really pumping. Pumping, like the transportation system is improved a lot. Yeah, the roads don't feel like they're as congested as they were. The mm. traffic's moving a lot more freely. Um, but the restaurants, like the quality of food, the fit out, the mm. service, mm. Uh, I've. I've been surprised. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you travel widely and I travel a bit, but you go to these, you know, big cities around the world and you see these incredible, beautiful restaurants and it reminds you of a lot of what Maryvale do, Justin Hems and I. I mean, you see, like, they actually put on Instagram, like, they have a private jet, a Maryvale private jet that flies their best chefs all around the world. And they go and look at restaurants in these big cities around the world and steal the idea and bring it back here. And so he's lifted the bar and then a lot of other restaurateurs have have to lift the bar to have these kind of world-class restaurants, which is fantastic. Yeah. If you love your restaurants. Well, I'm, I'm a jockey, but I'm, I enjoy my food. Yeah. <laughs> and you like the ocean? Do you, you get into the ocean? Uh, I do. I like getting in there and having a swim. Um, surfing's one thing I might look to take up. Yeah. When I was in Hawaii, I got out there on the longboard and I quite enjoyed it. So uh, I'm a long way from... Being a proper rider. It'd be interesting to see you trying to position yourself in the lineup at Bondi. Yeah. <laughs> when you, you know, you, you're good at positioning yourself in the world's best races, but once you get out of the Bondi, you'll be the apprentice. And yeah, no one will give you I'll any. be getting handled. <laughs> I'll have to go to somewhere remote to, to yeah. try and cut my teeth to start with. But, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, my son likes to fish, so maybe we'll do a little bit fish, a bit, bit of fishing. But, yeah, I, I'm not sure what life uh, in Australia will look, look yeah. like for me. I'm going to have to find my way when I get back here, and that is something that uh, – I have been thinking a bit about um, the jockey club, you know, fortunately for us over the last few years have employed a, a number of different people uh, from, from physios to mental health coaches mm. to nutritionists to psychologists and all those types of people. So um, I, when I get back to Hong Kong, there's, there's one lady that they've just brought on um, that I've said to her, uh, I think I'm going to be okay in retirement. Mm. But everyone's telling me that it's going to be a big shock mm. and that you don't really know what to expect. So I'm going to work with her to mm-hmm. try and transition myself mm. uh, into the next chapter of my life if I can. So when I do take that step, then hopefully I am able to uh, slip back into society and not spiral out of control. And are you really famous in Hong Kong? Like if you walk down the street, everyone knows who you are? And Yeah, so yeah. it'd be like any... Uh, A-list celebrity in, in Hollywood, right? So I can't go anywhere without uh, every day someone wants a photo. Yeah. Um, but that's fine. They, they get their photo. They wish me well and they move on. Um, you go to a restaurant, you know, you get the best tables. Everyone opens the door for yeah. you, things like that. I'll be at restaurants quite often uh, and go to pay the bill and the bill's paid. Wow. Because yeah. an owner has heard that I'm there and yeah. he's rung up and, and fixed it up. Wow. So there, there are all those things. Um, that happen and, you know, I get to the golf course and they're always – they're rushing the car to get my bag for me. <laughs> you know, it's uh, – it, it is good. It makes you feel like uh, 
you're wanted. But mm. uh, Hong Kong has always felt like that to me. Even when things weren't going well and I was walking around the city, uh, people were, were always very respectful and um, they were always wishing us well and um, they, re they certainly recognise who we are. You can't get in a taxi in Hong Kong without yeah. the, the guy having the form guide on the dash screen. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Great place to finish. Thank you very much, mate. No we appreciate it. Cheering you on for a big season and a big spring. So, Thank best you. Best of luck, buddy. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.